Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather in your house this great day that you have provided, that we can enter into your gates with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise and to declare how great, how marvelous, how wonderful our God is. Praise the Lord from whom all blessings flow. I pray that you'll bless our hearts today. I pray that you will encourage and strengthen. I pray that you will save and heal. I pray today that you will just give folks today that are going through valleys, give them hope. And Lord, just today give them your presence, your power, your spirit, and your goodness and your blessings today. We are delighted that we today can call you our Heavenly Father. And it's all because Jesus died our death and paid our debt of sin on the cross. And today we can declare how magnificent our God is, how wonderful. Lord, you are worthy of our praise and how thankful we are. I pray now for a mighty moving of the Spirit of God. The church assembled. And Lord, there was a moving of God. Lord, we read about it in the book of Acts. We want that moving of God in this place today. In the hearts of the lives of your people. And Lord, you inhabit the praise of your people. May we lift up our voices in adoration. May we lift up our hearts in thanksgiving. May we lift up our hands and say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Have your way in this place today. The music, the message, then the great fellowship of food that we're going to partake of a little bit later on. Just may it be a great day in your house is my prayer. And all the praise we'll give to you, for it's in Jesus' name we do pray. And all God's servants say it a hearty what? Thine, Amen. O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all, and in thine hand is power and might, and in thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. Amen. This is a great song this morning. Jump in and sing with us. Amen.
to see you. I want to see you as you are. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. He's worthy. Amen. Amen.
just stomp your feet till you find that gospel beat Cause he's all you'll ever need, all you'll ever need Clap your hands and stomp your feet till you find that gospel beat Cause he's all you'll ever need, all you'll ever need I've got an old church choir singing in my soul I got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful I've got an old church choir singing in my soul I've got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful I've got a heart overflow Cause I've been restored There ain't nothing gonna steal my joy No, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy Oh, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Oh, would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power. It's in the blood of the Lamb. There is power. All right, choir's coming down. Shake hands, hug next, tell somebody you're glad to see them in God's house. Hi, everybody. Glad you're with us today. Right here at Yosemite Baptist Church's homecoming. And man, we are excited. The choir's been singing. The singers have been singing. We're going to be preaching. It's going to be a great day. And I just pray your heart is being blessed today also. Come worship with us in an exciting church that loves God. Great people that will treat you right. That's what you'll find here at Gethsemane Baptist Church. 411 Blue Ridge Street, one block off of Lakeside Drive. We're near the main entrance to, of course, Nancy University of Lynchburg, formerly Lynchburg College. Well, we're looking forward. We've got some great things happening. Coming to Gethsemane, November the 1st. That's it's a Thursday night at 7 p.m. It's Avenue Trio. You don't want to miss it. These young men are really on fire for God. And some other great things. November's going to be Thanks and Praise Month. It's just going to be a great celebration. And we want you to be a part of it. God bless you today. We're praying for you. Come worship the Lord with us here in GBC. God bless you. There's power in the blood. Power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power. It's in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power. It's in, in the, the precious blood of the Lamb. Oh, would you be wider, much wider than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in this life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the power in the blood. There is power, 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 power. wonder-working power. It's in the blood. It's in the blood of the Lamb. Of the Lamb. There is power, 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 power. power. wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily as praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the power in the blood. There is power, 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 wonder working power. It's in the blood. It's in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, 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 wonder working power. It's in, in the, the precious blood of the Lamb. Oh, yes, there's power, 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 wonder working power. It's in the blood. It's in the blood of the Lamb. Of the lamb. There is power, 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 power wonder working power. It's in the precious blood of the Lamb. There's power, 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 power wonder working power. It's in the blood. It's in the blood. There is power, 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 power wonder working power. power. It's in the precious blood of the Lamb. Of the Lamb. There is power, 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 power wonder working power. It's in the blood.
the blood. It's in the blood of the Lamb. Of the lamb. There is power, 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 power. power. Wonder working. Amen. It's in the precious One more time. Here we go. Lamb. One more time. There is power, 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 power. Wonder working. Power. It's in the blood. It's in the blood of the Lamb. Of the lamb. There is power, 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 power. power. Wonder, wonder working. Power. It's in the precious blood of the blood of the to me the day that love called my name when Jesus died what sacrifice what love and compassion was shown when he stretched out his hands and said I love you this much such mercy has never been known and when he cried it's finished everything changed i will never forget that day beyond measure the Savior has for me I can't understand why he cared so much that he would die upon that old tree he took my sins and all I had been and made my there at the cross his love called to me now that same love is calling to you you ask me what love is it's a man hanging on a tree you ask me what mercy is it's that man dying instead of He stretched out his hands and said, I love you this much. Such mercy has never been known. And when he cried, it's finished. Yeah. 
Long before the dawn, before the rooster has his say, the farmer and the farmer's wife begin another day. She will wash the dishes, and he will milk the cows. Like every spring for forty years, it's time to hitch the plow. Now he knows every pharaoh like the back of his hand. Somehow they've made a living, living off the land. It ain't nothing fancy, and it don't look like much to some. But these fields can feed a family before the winters come. For thirty-nine harvest time, the farmer's wife has prayed that the man she'd always loved go to church with her one day. But he's as stubborn as the mule that helps him work the summer fields. She prays for grace, she prays for rain, and the crops that they will yield. Now no one knows what's going on inside that old man's head. When October Sunday morn, he got out of bed. He put on his coat and tie. He polished up his shoe. Farmer joined the farmer's wife together on the pew. Now that little congregation, they won't soon forget that day. He went to the altar and he knelt down to pray and like leaves on the trees the tears began to fall the seeds that she had planted had been growing after all forty harvest times forty crops that they had grown forty years of sundays she went to church alone, but she won't see the autumn leaves the same way anymore. It's the October harvest she's been waiting for. Now, if you have a little faith before you sow that seed below. You'll see it grow. You'll see it grow. Yes, grow, and grow. Forty harvest times, forty crops that they had grown. Forty years of Sundays, she went to church alone. But she won't see the autumn leaves the same way anymore. anymore. It's the October harvest. She's been waiting for It's the October harvest She's been waiting for Today, uh, I want to continue in the series we've been on pertaining to Joseph and, of course, ultimately in the book of Genesis. And uh, talking today about learning to love providence. And some of these messages have been a little bit unusual of sorts, but it's a part of God's word and we need to hear, receive what God's speaking to us. And this is a very important message. And we'll be giving you some facts around this message, but I want you to see ultimately what God's trying to speak to our hearts about. And we're going to be looking at Genesis 41. We've, we've been on an intensified journey through Genesis and we're walking with Joseph We've been with the pit experience and where he was sold then into slavery. And last week we stepped into the uh, prison place that he was at and the troubles and trials that he was facing. And we've seen how God has taken him through the ups and the downs in life. Well, you know, ups and downs are part of living, whether your name is Joseph and you are found in the pages of God's word or you live in this area and today you're facing 
challenges and difficulties in place. No, you may not be in a pit and you may not be in a prison, but you're going through some pretty perilous times that's taking a ha wreaking havoc in your life. But I want to encourage you today to remind yourself and to be reminded as God tells us that he's a God who never leaves us nor does he forsake us. And today we have a blessed assurance that God is for us today. And I'm so glad that we have that promise taken from God's word. And in the process, we understand what God is doing in the ups and the downs that Joseph was facing. God is teaching him who he, who God is. And you know, we many times have a perception of God and we think, well, we know who God is. I mean, he's the God who created the heavens and the earth. He's the God of the Genesis of count of creation. He's the God of the, of the salvation that he's provided through the cross of Calvary. And he is certainly God and we do not deny that and we thank him for that. But it's more than just knowing there is a God. There's more than just saying, yeah, Jesus died on the cross for my sins. Yeah, I acknowledge that he is a great and mighty and awesome God. And that is all great in its place. But God wants you to know him. And he wants you today to walk with him. And he wants you to understand the providence that he has in your life. That he's with you all the way. We're going to pick up today in Genesis 41, verses 1 through 8. Now, we're going to read these verses, and you're going to read these along with me as we throw them on the screen, or you can follow in your Bible, and we're even going to stand for it here in just a moment. And as we read the first eight verses of this chapter, you're going to say, Huh? What is he talking about? Cattle and corn? Ugly cattle, fat cattle? Great corn, not so nice corn? What is God trying to tell us here? Well, this is actually part of the dream that Pharaoh had that ultimately we're going to see that Joseph interpreted. Let's stand for the reading of God's word. And we're picking up with verse 1. And it came to pass at the end of the two full years that Pharaoh dreamed. Now, those two, those two full years are the two years that Joseph has been in prison that Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river, and behold, there came up out of the river seven well-favored kine and fatted shed, and they fed in a, matter, in a meadow. So these are seven cows that are looking good. And behold, seven other kine came up after them out of the river, ill-favored and lean-fleshed, and stood by the other kind upon the brink of the river. Now something's going to happen here that just doesn't happen. And the ill-favored and lean-fleshed kind did eat of the seven well-favored and fat kind. So Pharaoh awoke. And I'm sure he said, whew, too many tacos last night, man. <laughs> Amen. And he slept and dreamed the second time, and behold, seven ears of corn came up upon one stalk, rank and good. And behold, seven thin ears, blast and blasted with the east wind, sprung up after them. And the seven thin ears devoured the seven rank and full ears, and Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And it came to pass in the morning... That his spirit was troubled. I think so. I would be too. And he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof. And Pharaoh told them his dream, but there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. May God add the blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. And you're probably thinking in your mind, how in the world can you get a message out of seven ears and seven Cows, how can you get anything out of that that we can walk out of here with today? Well, hang with me and let's see if we can. Today we're back on Space Mountain with, if you've ever been on Space Mountain, you know what I'm talking about. But we're back on Space Mountain with Joseph because there's a lot of ups and downs if you've ever been on Space Mountain. And life many times brings with it a lot of ups and downs, a lot of good and a lot of bad and a lot of challenges and a lot of blessings. Now, if you'll recall, last Sunday, Joseph, he'd helped a fellow prisoner and, uh, who was the cupbearer in Pharaoh's court. And he showed his gratitude by basically, I'm going to remember you, Joseph. And he forgot about him. He got released and he went back basically to the position that he was in and he became well favored. But he forgot the promise that he'd made to Joseph. I'm glad we've got a God that never forgets us. 
And even when people turn their back on us, forget us, and all the challenges that we face in life, I'm glad that we have a God who said, I'll never leave you nor will I forsake you. So looking at this, two years have passed, and Joseph has continued to be in prison over 700 days. Now remind yourself of this, 700 days of sitting there and basically doing nothing but thinking. Thinking about where he's been. Thinking about what happened with his brothers, his father at home. Thinking about the coat of many colors, the pit that he found himself in. Then finding himself being sold out and basically taken into Egypt and then sold as a slave and, and serving Potiphar's house and then being falsely accused by his wife. I mean, that's a lot to think about. And he didn't do anything to initiate or to bring this on upon himself. As a matter of fact, he was doing everything in the right position that God had called him to do. So you think about this wasted time, there's wasted opportunities, there's wasted plans. And you know, sometimes we can take those areas of our lives and we can relate to that and think, you know, I got a lot of wasted years in my life. Well, let me tell you what, you can't do anything about what's in the past, but forget about it and learn from it. Don't live in where you used to be and what you used to be. Come to the realization today that if you are born again and a child of God, who you are and what you are by the grace of God. And maybe today you're not all you could, should, and ought to be, but let me tell you what, thank God you're not what you used to be. You've been transformed and changed by the power of God, and today you are a child of the King, and that's something to rejoice over today and to praise God for. So, you know, sometimes we think about, man, I got wasted time, wasted opportunities, time has gone by, I've gotten older, and you know, if I could turn the clock back, you can't. Learn from it and press forward. Press towards the mark, the prize of the high calling that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, you know, sometimes you may feel like you're just spinning your wheels and you're not going anywhere in life and you just feel like, man, when are things going to change? Let me tell you tonight, or today, Maybe the night before I finish. Not really. You cannot think about those issues. You've got to permit God and trust God to work in your life. So could it be that God maybe sometimes puts our life in neutral? Sometimes we're not progressing forward. Maybe things are not going as we desire. Things are not happening. I mean, Joseph is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's favored of God, but his favor has landed him into prison. He said, preacher, that makes no sense. Well, in the human thinking, what God does doesn't make any sense anyway. But that's where you've got to learn to live by faith and trust in the Lord. It's not what you think it's important. It's what God knows and what God works in your life. And see, what you think, man, I'm on a... I'm on a wheel and not going nowhere. I'm spinning my wheel. I'm not moving forward. I'm not, I'm not progressing. It just seems like you've got to wait upon the Lord for they that wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength. And you've got to realize today the joy of the Lord is your strength. So you can't get down defeated and discouraged. You've got to trust God. I mean, all the years I mean, two years now passed, he's in prison. The years that passed prior to that, it just seems like, man, you know, is it really worth serving God? I can tell you today, it is absolutely worth serving God. And when you stand before him, you will be glad that you were a child of the king. I promise you that. So Joseph's life, his, his life seems to revolve around two dreams. Everything that has happened in his life has been... Because of dreams. Remember, he dreamed two dreams, and that's why he was put in the pit and they were going to kill him, but then he was sold to this caravan that took him to Egypt. And, and, and because of these dreams, that's what landed him and where he's at. And then, while he's in, of course, in prison, he interprets the dreams of the, of the cup holder and, and the baker. And now, here it is, he's faced with another dream situation of Pharaoh. And his dreams has really got him deported into slavery. His dreams has caused a lot of his problems and difficulty. And you would think, you know, maybe he, was, he would have been better just to stay like he was and not done anything and just try to get through life. It never works when you're doing it that way. I'm going to tell you something. When you're serving God, that comes, comes with challenges. 
That comes with issues. That comes with problems. That comes with things that you can't understand. And it would be very easy to grab the white towel and throw it in and throw your hands up and say that I quit. But God did not raise you up to be a quitter. God raised you up today to be a child of the king. And a child of the king does not quit in life. So you get knocked down, it's God who gets you back up. So you face challenges and trials in your life, but you get through those with God on your side. So you don't give up. God does not raise up quitters. He raises up winners. Amen. So I want you to look at some things today. God and what he did in Joseph's life. And I want you to seek today an application of what God wants to do in your life today. Because you know what? If you're saved, you're a work in progress. And if you're not saved, you can be. Because if you're not saved, your your life right now is a dead in street. You're going to die one day. And if you die without Jesus, it's not good results. Because you're going to be parted from the Lord and you're going to find yourself in a place that you can't get yourself out of. Folks, it's not worth it. Give your heart and your life to Jesus. And I'm sure each of us, I know as a Christian, I've had my share of challenges and sometimes I feel like I've had somebody else's too. But you know what? It's those places I've learned to trust in God and learn to rely upon him and learn not to quit. You've got to remember the story of Joseph. It's not about Joseph. It's all about God. It's about what God wants to do in his life. It's that God wants to do something in our lives. So here's our theme of what I want you to see today. I'm trying to give, been trying to give you a theme about what we're doing. Here's the theme. In Christ, our God is working even if you're not sure that he is. <laughs> I like that. In Christ, our God is working even if you're not sure that he is. And sometimes you say, hello, God, are you there? And sometimes the heavens are silent, but that does not mean that God is not there. That just means something's going on. And God is working something to your benefit and your good. So you can't bail and jump ship. You've got to put your confidence and your trust in the Lord. So remember today, let's say that together. Let's read it. The theme is what? In Christ, our God is working even if you're not sure that he is. I can assure you God has got it all under control. Amen. From Genesis 41, verses 1 through 36, there are four parts to this. I'm just going to give it to you today as just information. Verses 1 through 14 is Pharaoh's describing his dream of what he has been through. You go from verses 15 to 16, you find Joseph, Joseph points Pharaoh to God. Then you pick up with verse 17 down through verse 32. Joseph gives the interpretation of the dream. And then lastly, in verses 33 through 36, Joseph tells Pharaoh what he needs to do in light of what God has told him. So, for two years, Joseph is in prison. Pharaoh has had a dream. There's been seven plump cows... And seven ugly cows. There has been, uh, in verse 4, the ugly cows ate up the plump cows. Well, this is terrible. (laughs) This is your first recorded case of mad cow disease. (laughs) (laughs) Then there's the second dream concerning the grain. Pharaoh wakes up. Calls in everybody, his magicians, his soothsayers, and all those tarot card readers and everything else, and everybody that has some kind of some kind of pagan knowledge. And the only problem was no one could interpret the dream for Pharaoh, and he is livid. So the cupbearer said, uh, "I remember a guy that was in prison, Joseph." You know, he interpreted a dream for me. Pharaoh, maybe he can help you out. Well, Joseph appears before Pharaoh. And of course, Pharaoh is frantic. He's desirous. He wants the interpretation. He's confused. He's worried. He's fretting. And so Joseph comes before him. And listen to what Joseph says in verse 16. It is not in me. 
And let me tell you right there, he's fortunate that Pharaoh didn't say, all right, take him out of here and kill him. But he says, God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. I'm glad God is the author of peace. I'm glad God is the provider of peace. I'm glad God is the supplier of peace. And I'm glad his peace surpasses all understanding. Amen. So the first point I want to show you today, what can you learn from today's message about cows and grain? God's providence eventually makes sense. Verse 1 begins with a lot of frustration. Pharaoh is very frustrated about the issues with the cows and the grain and the dream that he has had with no explanation. And he is very troubled, has a troubled heart. So Joseph is in the same spot, kind of doing the same thing. I mean, you know, he has tried to live for God and do that which is right and honor God. He didn't give up. He didn't throw in the towel. He didn't quit. And he's continued to persevere, is a good word, through his faith in God and trust God. But you know he had all the makings of what we could say is the ingredients of a lot of frustration. And let's face it today. Let's deal with you and I for a moment. We today face a lot of frustrations too, don't we? We have issues and things come up. We have trials. We have physical problems. We have uh, family problems. We have financial problems. We have all types of things that arises in our lives that brings a lot of frustration, a lot of sleepless nights, and a lot of anger. And we next find ourselves in a position that we're not really, we're drifting away from God. We're becoming rebellious because of the frustration that we're in. You've got to trust God in all things today. God has never promised in the pages of this blessed black back book that life is always going to be sunshine and roses, good days and sunshiny days. You're going to have trials and troubles, but it's the God that's with you in all times that will bring you through whatever you're facing. So you've got to learn to rely upon God because some of you right now, let me tell you what, you walked in this church this morning, you sat down and you've got a lot of frustration going on in your life. You say, but I'm a, I'm a Christian pastor. You still have frustrations in your life. That's a part of it. It rains on the just and the unjust. It comes to everybody. You're living in a fallen world. We are fallen people. We are sinners. But praise God, I'm glad we have a God who came and did something about our frustration, our fallen estate, and made a way where we could have hope, and we could have peace, and we could have understanding, and that we can have victory over every frustration that we face in life. Amen. That's our God. So this time is passing by. These dreams that Pharaoh has had mean something. And now the, the mistreating, abused, forgotten, slave Joe, uh, Joseph is standing in front of the most powerful man in the known world in that day. Now stop here and think a moment. Think about your life. What are you facing? What frustrations are you in? What agonies are you going through? What pains, what fears, what things are encircling your life right now that's seemingly trying to pull you down? Think about time and, and life and the experiences. But you know what these things do in our lives if we'll really look at them in the right sense that we are? It, it will bring us to a position today that we can get a better view of what God's trying to do in our life. Our, our method so many times is this. We start going through those troubled waters and those valleys and dark places of our lives. And our first thing is, God, why am I going through this? Look at so-and-so. They're not living for you. They're not serving you. They're not faithful. I'm trying to read the Bible. Go to church. I'm trying to, I'm trying to do something for your kingdom, God. And why is it raining trouble on my life? Because God knows what you're made of. And God knows that you can trust him through everything that you face and that God can enrich your faith through the trials that you're facing. It's not always going to be this way. Did you hear what I just said? There's a better day coming. Hallelujah. God is trying to do something. Get your eyes off of where you're in and where you're going through and the circumstances that are surrounding you and the trouble that you'll face. Draw your attention in on God. 
Say, Lord, I don't understand it all, but you know what? I've got enough faith in you just to say I'm going to trust God anyway. Regardless of what people say to me, even when I feel like throwing in the towel, I'm not going to do it by the grace of God. Are you in a crisis event in your present life right now? You may very well be. And, and I know you today, listen, I know today that you don't pursue pain, and I know today you're not looking for it, but I want to tell you something. There's a purpose in every pain that we face. And I know today you didn't want to come to hear me say, you're going to have pains in life. Folks, whether I say it or not, that's a given. But you've got to learn to see in the pain the provision that God has for you. Keep this before you today. God's doing something through all the trouble that you're facing today, that you're dealing with. Our pain is the Lord's schoolmaster. So pain is what God uses to teach us how he is working through the hard places and bringing about the providence of his will in your life. And I know that's a tough pill to swallow. I know that's a hard thing to face. But I've got good news for you today. God is greater than whatever you're in. And God is still in control. And you can still trust him. I said you can still trust him, amen. amen. And know that God's going to work in your benefit and your good. So the pain that we feel that we go through is probably because of one of three things in your life. Here's the first one. Sometimes it's God's discipline that happens in our life. We face these areas, and these are things that God brings about in our life to bring discipline. Discipline is when we have committed a sin, and the discipline has corrective action. Amen. So God's discipline, I know you're going to love this one. God's discipline makes you better. That's what I thought I would hear. I didn't hear any applause. I didn't hear too many amens. I heard more. <laughs> it will. It'll make you better. The Bible says God chastens or disciplines those whom he loves. Don't you love your children? If you see your children doing something wrong, whether they were small or big, don't you try to help them to show them that they're making some bad decisions? I would hope you would. That's a form of discipline. Keep in mind, our sin, our sin today is paid for at the cross by Christ in full. And so God's punishment and wrath that was against us, thank God Jesus satisfied before the Father through his death on the cross. So Jesus took the punishment for all sinners today. He bore our load. He carried our sorrows. He took our grief, just not our sins, but everything that you're going to face in life. He bore it on the cross. And you know what he says? One of the seven sayings in Isaiah 53. With his stripes, we are healed. Amen. Amen. You know, I'm glad today that God brings discipline in our lives to draw us back into a closer walk in relationship with him. The second little bullet is this. Sometimes it's God's sanctification process. Sanctification means making us more like Christ. Three things. One could be discipline. One could be sanctification. For God sometimes has to prune. That pruning basically is a form of purification to make us more dependent upon the Lord. You think, man, I got all the answers. I got all the solutions. I got all the knowledge. I've got all the resources. No, you don't have anything. The only thing that you need is Jesus in your life. Because he today will enable and empower you to do whatever is needful in your life. Sometimes the difficulties or to drive us to Christ to develop a more sanctified, set-apart, dependent life on Christ. So we go through difficulties, and the way that we walk through it is through this fact that I can do all things through Christ. Oh, I love Philippians 4.13, Pastor. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Get the right perception of the verse. You can face and feel the pains that it brings with confidence because it's God who strengthens you. You know what that strengthening is, is relating to? Your attitude of what you're facing. 
whether it's a doctor's report, whether it's a struggle that you're in, whether it's a, a mess that you found yourself in today, whether it's depression, whether it's frustration, whether it's aggravation. I mean, the list goes from A to Z and repeats itself about 20 times. Hallelujah. Whatever it is today, you can come through it because it's Christ who strengthens you. The Lord is my strength. You can face whatever you face in life with confidence and hope that God is never going to check out on you. You can have hope in Christ today that it, whatever you're facing, it's not bigger than God. God he can satisfy and settle, and today he can give a solution in every situation that you're facing in life. Amen. Third point, sometimes... It's not just sanctification. It's just not discipline. Sometimes it's glorification. We live in a fallen world. We live today in a disordered universe. As sin has affected all of creation. And in this fallen world, God uses tragedy and uses even sorrow, difficulties, confusion to remind us that this world is not my home. Amen. And I'm glad it's not. Paul said to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians 4, 17 through 18, For our light afflictions, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Sometimes the pains on earth are to make the joy of heaven that much sweeter. Amen. God's providence, his providence will make sense one day. You've got to trust him until that day shall come. Second thing, God's people were created to glorify God. You, me, we were created to glorify God. You go to verse 15, 16, and Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream and there's none that can interpret it. And I have heard say of thee that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it's not, it's not in me. He said, this is not about me, Pharaoh. He says, God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Whew. Man, I'm glad our answers come from God. I'm glad when there's total confusion in Washington, our answers come from God. When there's total, total confusion, world and global speaking, I'm glad our answers come from God. I'm glad that even when Satan gets in your face and tries everything he can do to try to pull you down to the depths of frustration and to give up, I'm glad there's a God who's still in control. Thank God we have such a God with us today. I'm glad that we have such a God because God is the one, God is the one who has the power. Amen. Amen. And I'm glad he invests that power in you and I. Two things that Joseph had you need today. One, a realistic view of himself. You've got to see yourself as you are. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all missed the mark. And if you've never given your life to Christ today, you're going to die in your sin and go to hell. Why? I'm trying to do the best I can. It won't work. But I came from a great family. It won't work. I even got my name on the church roll. Bad English here. It ain't going to work. You can join every church in Lynchburg, the state of Virginia, and the whole United States and the entire world. But I'm going to tell you right now, it will not get you into the pearly gates of heaven. There's only one means. There's only one way. There's only one process of salvation. Jesus says, come as you are. See yourself in realistic means. See yourself today as lost because all have sinned. All have missed the mark. All today have fallen flat. We all have sinned and we've all rejected Jesus. But he said, I'm not going to leave you like I found you. He said, I died on the cross for you. God sent his son to die on the cross for our horrible, deplorable, vile sins. He said, I died for you and all that will come to me, I don't know I was cast out. You can come to Christ today. You don't have to leave this building. You don't have to worry about your future. You can put your heart, your life in the hands of Jesus by realizing you're a sinner. Christ died for you on this cross and saying, God, forgive me. Come into my heart and say, you don't have to pray 
some long, eloquent prayer. All you got to do is say, God, I'm a sinner. I'm in need of your salvation. Forgive me of my sins. Come to my heart and my life and save me. Thank you, Lord. And if you meant that with your heart, God saves you on the spot. Amen. But you've got to come to the place of realism of who you really are and become and get a realistic view of yourself. The second thing is you better get a healthy view of God, of how great our God is. And isn't he a great God today? I believe he's even deserving of a little praise from his people today. How great is our God? How great is to be praised? Amen. You need to realize, man, he not just doesn't save your soul and supplies your need. He's with you for you all the way through life and is prepared a place for you. And one day he's coming again. And in the moment, the twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed before we shall see him face to face. And behold, his glory. And you think you can praise him a little bit here. Oh, my God. Can you imagine when we arrive in that city and behold his glory? Oh, my God. How the heavens will resound and light up with the presence and the power of God that we praise him for the great God that he is. These two things are the primary issues of a dynamic faith that God wants to work. If your faith is flat, if you'll get these two things involved in your life, you will develop a dynamic faith through the power of God. Amen. So Joseph understood. I'm almost through. That's not what he said. I'm saying that. <laughs> I want you to grab this idea. Bring it over. Let's grab this, what we just talked about. Let's now plug it into the New Testament. There's not one part of us that's not affected by sin. This world is affected by sin. And this leads us to a place of total inability, depravity. Jonathan Edwards, the great pulpiteer, said, We bring nothing to our salvation but the sin that makes it necessary. So your first step is to glorify God and to realize it's not you. It's all about him. You need something. You need something outside of you. That's what Joseph was saying in verse 16. He says, I'm going to give you something that's outside. I can't do this, but God can. And you know, that's so true in our lives today. You just try and you try and you try your little self to death, but you realize you just can't seem to get past go. You know why? Because you've got to realize it's not about what you're doing. It's about what he has already done and wants to do in your life today. God's a holy and a just God, a creator today. He, he today punishes sin, but also he's a merciful God who forgives sin. And he provides a substitute for our sins on the cross. At the cross, the justice of God is satisfied. At the cross, the grace of God is applied to anyone who will come and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Third point, God's sovereignty always calls for a response. Now, when we talk about sovereignty, we're talking about that God is in absolute control of everything. You may think, man, really? Yes, he is. And all the mess that you see happening in the world is all a part of what is about to happen. That great day, that great getting up morning, that great rapture day that's going to occur, it's, it's all leading to that. Amen. Go to verse 32, and it reveals, this is Genesis 41, and for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because the thing is established by God and God will shortly bring it to pass. What does this tell us about God? You say, preacher, I, I don't know. I'll tell you. God knows what is going to happen. God has ordained what is going to happen. And God is in control of what is going to happen. Amen. So our God not only knows the future, our God holds the future. So God in his sovereignty of grace has given us one that is called Jesus. He took the place of sinners. He died the death that we were deserving of on the cross. And if you will, by faith today, turn your sins over to him, I'm glad today he will turn your life around for him and save you. If you're wondering why things are happening in your life, it's God trying to get your attention. And you know, folks, I've never met a person that does not need help. Every one of you in this room, you need help. And I'm at the front of the line. 
But I'm glad I've got a God who is my helper. And if you will bring whatever you are facing, the frustrations, the aggravations, the situations, and everything else that you can put into those categories that you face in life. No, maybe you're not a Joseph, and maybe you're not going through what he went through, but you are going through some stuff today. I'm glad to tell you there's a sovereign God who can handle what you're facing. But God needs you to do something today. Are you listening to me? Really? Really? You've got to come to the end of yourself. You've got to stop trying to be in control. You need to come and say, God, take over today. I give my life afresh and anew to you. Refresh me, revive me, refill me, use me. God, speak to my heart. If you've been suffering and you're struggling today, I'm telling you, there's a Jesus that says, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. If you're here today and you're lost, his hand simply says, come now. Let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they can be as white as snow. You can be redeemed. Your life can change. God wants to help you today. But you've got to make an effort of realizing who you are and trusting who he is. Would you bow your heads for a moment? I want to encourage you to come to him today because you need him. Let me ask you a couple quick questions and I'm through. Have you ever come to him in salvation? Have you ever called upon the Lord and asked him to forgive you of your sins to come into your heart and your life and save your soul? Have you ever been saved? Well, preacher, uh, not sure. You're a candidate for salvation. Folks, it's not an embarrassing thing to get saved. It's something to rejoice over. And if you don't know Christ as your personal Savior right now, I want to pray with you right where you are right now in this building. I want to pray with you this prayer. If you will do several things. One, will you agree with me? And I want everyone in this building to answer if you agree with an amen. Do you agree today that we all are sinners in need of salvation? Amen. Do you agree with me today that Jesus died on the cross for every sin that you've committed and even the sin where you have rejected him? Do you agree with me on that? Amen. Now, we agree. But let's agree on one final thing. Let's agree on you calling on the Lord. Would you pray this prayer with me and, and invite him into your heart right now? Dear God in heaven, I am a sinner. Jesus did die for me. Thank you for caring for me that much. Please forgive me of my sin, my sin of rejecting you, and all the other sins that I've committed. Forgive me, O oh Lord. Come into my heart, my life. Save me right now. Thank you, Lord. I don't have to go to hell. Heaven is now my home. Bless the Lord in Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer a moment ago, I ask you to do one thing so I can better pray for you. I won't embarrass you. I won't come to you. I won't drag you down here. I won't do anything like that. I just want to know so I can pray for you better. You prayed that prayer a moment ago and you meant that prayer. Would you just slip me right now? Just slip your hand up and raise it and get my attention. Thank you. Anyone else? Carlton, I prayed that prayer a moment, a moment ago and I meant that prayer. Now let's stand to our feet. We're going to have a song. It's called Homecoming Song. You know, homecoming is just not about eating chicken and having a good time in the house of God. Homecoming is about coming back to God. And maybe there's a need in your life today that you need to come. Could I challenge you right now in the struggles and the trials and the problems that you face in life? Would you come and bring them to Christ right now? Come on. He's calling. He's knocking at your heart's door. Would you come? Let God move on your life today.